Thank you. Thank you, Katrina, for that really lovely introduction. And thank you to the entire history department um, for its hospitality today. Thank you all for coming. And a very special thank you to the Pauli family um, for supporting these kinds of forums, um, which I think we could use more of everywhere. And I'm delighted to be here in Lincoln um, to participate in one. So about where I'm going to start. About a year before one goal, my latest book, which Katrina just mentioned, came out. A friend sort of casually asked me what I was working on. And when a non-historian asks a historian what they're working on, it's really exciting because most normal people don't ever ask us what we do. So I was excited, and yet I, I didn't really have a good answer because we never get asked that question. Um, so I said nothing all that relevant because it was sort of a, a defense mechanism. Just a book about Somali refugees who play soccer. The conversation took place mere hours, hours, I'm not exaggerating, after the man sitting in the White House signed the first executive order about immigrants and refugees, a travel ban that focused on seven Muslim-majority countries, including Somalia. Timing can be everything. I first wrote about the Lewiston Blue Devils, which is this soccer team in Maine, for CNN after the so-called Paris attacks occurred in November 2015. 
The first blasts on that terrible night in France took place at Stade de France. Inside, there was a soccer game going on, a friendly between Germany and France. From the Munich Olympics in 1972 to the cancellation of the Dakar rally in 2008 to the bombing of the Boston Marathon in 2013, sporting events are no stranger to terror. The Paris attacks added to an already intense conversation, global conversation, about refugees especially when rumors, which were later proven false, emerged that the bomber in Stade de France, who had accidentally detonated the bomb too early in the tunnel of the stadium, had entered Europe by exploiting a Syrian refugee network. This wasn't true, but this rumor took hold. In response, a slew of U.S. governors responded by declaring that their states would be off limits to any Syrians entering the United States ignoring that refugee resettlement is a federal order and not left for the states to decide where people who enter the U.S. legally will reside. In the midst of this crisis, a story landed on my desk about a remarkable high school soccer team in Lewiston, Maine. And there's a Lewiston, Nebraska, I know, because I get Google alerts about it occasionally. But this is Maine. It caught my eye because I lived in Lewiston for four years as an undergraduate at Bates College. That was a long time ago. When I was at Bates, Lewiston was not what Lewiston is today. Lewiston was an economically depressed, Quebecois, Catholic, overwhelmingly white, former mill town. Today, this city of about 36,000 people is host to nearly 7,000 African immigrants, the majority of whom are Somali, and many of whom play soccer play soccer really, really well. So this is a picture of the team shirt in 2015 for the Lewiston Blue Devils soccer team. Co-captains Abdi Sharif Hassan, who was born in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, and Austin Wing, whose French-Canadian heritage exemplifies much of Lewiston's immigration history until recently, settled upon this shirt via a text exchange during preseason. These are the two gentlemen I just mentioned, two captains, one the top scorer in history of the school and an All-American, and the other the greatest goalie, Austin, in the school's history, and also the son of the most active members of the soccer team's booster club. So they modified the U.S. men's national team motto to capture who they were and what they wanted to be and what they wanted to do. And that was to win their school's first state soccer championship. And they thought about it. And they thought about the question, what does it mean to be on a team? It means a lot in Lewiston, Maine. In Lewiston, it means that kids from different countries speaking different languages can come together and win. It means more because in Lewiston, these guys will tell you, soccer isn't just soccer. Soccer is life. Sport can do one of two things. Sport can bring people together. And if you go over to my hotel right now, you will see sport bringing people together as they come into town for homecoming. Or sport can push people apart. It's powerful. And it's never free and clear of its political moment. You knew this was coming. How does an image of Colin Kaepernick on bended knee bring people together? How does it pull people apart? The key in terms of unpacking questions like this is that it isn't, it can't be a bunch of simple narratives that sports are either good or sports are bad. It can't be that people either want to burn their Nike shoes or buy more Nike shoes. It's got to be a bigger look. It has to be a more complicated and nuanced look, a contextualized look, a historical look, because sports matter. As a historian studying sports, and by that I mean investigating them with the same intellectual rigor and the same intellectual curiosity and methodological ethics that we apply to any of more conventional areas of history, 
is not easy, despite what many people think when I tell them what I do. You write about history, they usually say. How fun. And that's dismissive. One of the biggest hurdles about studying sports is that which makes studying them so important. Sports are everywhere. They saturate our universe. So how then can we find a context in which to study sports, in which to think about sports, without knee-jerk reactions to what we see and what we hear on ESPN or on Football Night in America or on the Twitter feeds of sports writers and fans and athletes, in the headlines of the daily sports pages or on the cover of Sports Illustrated. How can we convince people, for example, that what Colin Kaepernick did every time he went down on bended knee during the national anthem before a game had a long and storied history behind it on many different levels and from numerous perspectives? In 1968, some 50 years ago, the New York Times ran a map of apartheid and the continent of Africa explaining what apartheid rule meant in the midst of the decolonization phenomenon unfolding in the thick of the Cold War. This map and these explanations did not run on the front page or on the editorial page. They ran on the sports page. The newspaper needed to give sports fans a little bit of a geopolitical history lesson because of the increasing presence of an upstart group, the Olympic Project for Human Rights, spearheaded by a young radical sociologist named Harry Edwards. It was a movement designed to disrupt the narrative of the role of athletes, perhaps especially black athletes, on the field, initiating a critical shift in the perception of the relationship between politics and sports. The eventual action taken by Tommy Smith and John Carlos, gold and bronze medalists in the men's 200 meters on October 16, 1968, at the Mexico City Olympic Games was the culmination of the OPHR's quest to use sport for political gain. Originally, the Olympic Project for Human Rights had proposed to boycott the Mexico City Olympics using the leverage of the potential medal hall, sort of an ultimatum, listen to us or else, that was so important in Cold War America. The medal race between the United States and the Soviet Union was an intense factor of the Cold War. Who could win the most medals? Who had the most sophisticated sports institutions? And so it felt like the future of the nation in many ways was in black hands as statisticians started to figure out how many medals the United States stood to lose if black athletes stayed at home. They gave this ultimatum, the OPHR, to expose the inequities within sport as well as achieve a series of what are now fairly familiar civil rights demands. So they announced the boycott with six demands. Fulfill these six demands or we don't go. The first was the restoration of Muhammad Ali's title. Muhammad Ali lost his championship title when he declared conscientious objector status to Vietnam. So the restoration of his title was number one. Number two, the removal of South Africa from international sporting competition. Number three, the desegregation of the New York Athletic Club, a whites-only athletic club that sponsored the largest indoor track meet of the year, which invited all athletes as performers, but didn't allow them to be members. The addition of two black coaches to the Olympic team. The addition of two black members to the International Olympic Committee. And lastly, number six, the removal of Avery Brundage as president of the International Olympic Committee, a man that Harry Edwards declared to be a devout racist and anti-Semite. I love the use of the word devout there. While the boycott effort failed to come to fruition, and it's a really interesting thing to think about in terms of the role of the individual within a, within a political movement and the consequences and decisions that have to be considered and weighed, and, and that's something to definitely think about when we're thinking about someone like Colin Kaepernick. Smith and Carlos used their moment once in Mexico City, and it was a rare moment for black men, in front of the world during the first major broadcast by an American network of an Olympic Games. ABC broadcast Mexico City in a 44-hour program, which I think NBC issues 44 hours of programming on the first day. 
um, there's more there's more Olympic program in a day than there actually are hours in a day. But 44 hours coming from Mexico City was the first time anyone had done this. So this was a platform that had never been seen before. So they used this moment in front of the world to symbolically speak out against racial oppression. And as you look at their image, black love fists, bowed heads, bare feet, before an audience that was held captive by the Star Spangled Banner and the American flag. They demanded that people listen to a silent gesture. As headlines around the globe began to focus, not on the race that these two had just run, and it was a significant race, Tommy Smith won the gold medal in the 200 meters with a sub 20 time, the first man to go below 20 seconds for 200 meters. They focused less on the race and his world record and more on the statement, which would eventually lead the United States Olympic Committee to revoke their credentials and send them home. But with this moment, a collective political notion of the black athlete had become solidified. These guys, in so many ways, drew Colin Kaepernick and so many others a blueprint. So my work on Smith and Carlos, which resulted in my first book, Not the Triumph, but the Struggle, which came out really long ago, 2002, looked to complicate the history of the black athlete in the United States, posing that while sport had been seen as a means of upward mobility for African Americans, it ensured the reinforcement of racialized notions of innate ability as well as social progress. And it created this dangerous battle between myth and reality. I designed my investigation into the black power action that took place in Mexico to shake up what I called the holy quartet of black athletes. Joe Lewis, do you want to guess? Do you want to take a minute? Joe Lewis, Jesse Owens, Jackie Robinson, and of course, Muhammad Ali. It's what I call the big four. If you want to get into a more nuanced and better gendered and less optimistic specific group, we can add figures. And we should add figures. This slide is probably a little bit more difficult to get. Jockey Isaac Murphy, cyclist Major Taylor, boxer Jack Johnson, tennis player Althea Gibson, Olympic decathlete Rafer Johnson, track superstar Wilma Rudolph, and so on. We can keep adding to this list of individual standouts, but regardless of how lengthy the list gets, the story of the black athlete in America tended towards in the popular imagination and still does largely. This familiar and terribly simplified chronology, political chronology, but chronology of individuals. The triumphs of Owens at the Berlin Olympics situated as a defilement of Hitler's ideologies of Aryan supremacy. The 1938 boxing bout between Lewis and German Max Schmeling, which was situated as a battle of democracy versus fascism. The integration of Major League Baseball in 1947 with Jackie Robinson placed as the beginning of the end of segregation in America. And think about that, 1947, that America got to look at a moment. What does desegregation look like? Almost a full decade before the Brown decision. And then there's the warrior poetry of Muhammad Ali, positioned as something both beautiful and frightening, something black and yet something so very American in an age when the two identities seemed almost incompatible to so many people. The modern black athlete, in an equation that pairs visibility with progress, is perceived to compete on a playing field that has been smoothed to create equal opportunity. In such a scenario, sports exist then in a vacuum without politics. We know better. I hope we know better. Sports are a great place to find politics. Sometimes those politics are implied, a product of the athlete's performance. Jesse Owens in Berlin is, is probably the best example of how that happens. Sometimes there's smaller moments that can compare, like this image which I illegally shot off my television, so apologies to NBC. <laughs> um, this is an image of Korean speed skater Lee Sang-hwa, who's being comforted by Japan's now Kadaira. This happened after she failed to defend her title in the women's 500 meter speed skating in front of a home crowd 
And this is what happened after the race. The two of them skating side by side, the Korean flag and that Japanese flag mingling. The turbulent history of the two countries, a profound part of the moment, and yet someone put, somewhat put on the back burner because it's also just an image of a winner trying to comfort a loser. Sometimes these politics are more overt. Smith and Carlos took their stance in the midst of a politically tumultuous year, one documented in black and white footage, one that feels deeply and visually embedded in our psyche. Thinking about, and, and Katrina went through some of these, the escalation of Vietnam, thinking of the, the very way that 1968 started with the Tet Offensive, and the Tet Offensive being launched to make the evening news back in the United States, that idea of the political spectacle, the assassination of figures like Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, student protests that enveloped the world, Paris, Mexico City, Prague, Chicago. This is the timeline that these two men inserted themselves into. And they inserted sports into it as well. Because there's no such thing as a level playing field. And an athlete should not have to stop being who he or she is the moment he or she steps onto the pitch or the track or the court or the field. But we never learn. That's why I have a job. <laughs> Despite the fact that the Olympic Games are inherently political, athletes march in with flags waving over their head, medals are counted according to country, which was never part of Pierre de Coubertin's game plan. Collectively, we are shocked every time politics overtly rises to the top of a sporting event. Like this commentator, Susan. I don't know Susan's last name. Susan was a commentator on CNN. And Susan had this to say after Lindsey Vaughn gave an interview to CNN about a month before the Pyeongchang Olympics, in which she said that if she was invited to the White House after the games, she would not go. I pray our Olympic Committee does a thorough check on its athletes to make sure they don't choose athletes who will kneel during our national anthem. Well, that would make for an interesting kind of Olympic trial. That you qualify for the team, but we have one more test for you. We're going to play the anthem and see how you react. <laughs> if any of you followed the Vaughn story, after that interview, people went into death threats. They wished her to crash. They hoped she broke her back. They hoped she broke her neck. When she became the oldest Alpine medalist, but not gold, they said that God didn't want her to have gold because she said she wasn't going to go to the White House. We continue to marvel that there might be politics in sports. People hear athletes say these things, but are they really listening to the athletes? It begs the question, what does it mean to represent? When is protest disrespectful? When is it heralded as part of an American ethos? When is protest something that we are proud of? And when is it something in which we yell the word ungrateful at the protester? That there is still shock and awe at the politics and sports can be head-scratching stuff. If you think about the back and forth between North and South Korea and the questions about North and South Korea going into the Pyeongchang Olympics, or questions about why openly gay athletes like Adam Raipon and Gus Kenworthy had a problem with Vice President Mike Pence leading the U.S. delegation into opening ceremony, or the horror at the near collapse of Brazil's infrastructure from hosting not just an Olympics, because why host an Olympics when you can host an Olympics and a World Cup? Or four years ago, Sochi, a little bit more than four now. I mean, Sochi, Sochi had everything. It had political oppression. It had anti-gay legislation, environmental concerns, the protests of indigenous peoples who found it offensive that sporting venues were being built on their sacred lands, bloated and corrupt and mysterious budgets, and a state leader that used the Olympics as a vanity project in a way that we hadn't seen since Hitler. Which brings us back to Pyeongchang for a moment. Because this happened. The Vice President of the United States decided to sit when the unified Korean delegation marched into opening ceremony. So if you take a close look at this, 
Everybody else in the dignitary box stood when North and South Korea marched in together. And Mike Pence and his wife sat. Think about that for a minute. Pence sitting at a sporting event to make a political point, which is his choice because sports are a great place to make a political protest. But this is the guy who walked out of a Colts game when players knelt. And this is a guy who went to that Colts game because he knew that the players were going to kneel. This is a guy who told the press pool outside the stadium to stay put because he was only going to be a moment or two. He knew he wasn't going to be long. By all accounts, then, it seems that Vice President Pence also mobilizes sporting events to make political points. There are many, many, many places to find politics in our world. We just need to look beyond the usual subjects sometimes. My work on Smith and Carlos tried to do that. It tried to create a different window into histories of civil rights movements. It tried to work beyond the usual cast of characters, as important as they are, Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer and Medgar and Elaine Brown and, of course, King, and to move beyond our most famous speeches and protests and spectacles. With my work on those two, what I wanted to do was bring sports more firmly into the equation of 1968 in order to gain a more fully fleshed out understanding of the impact of civil rights strategies and conversations regarding race and politics overt politics. But my fourth book, One Goal, which is about soccer, is about the political impact of sports in a less overt way. It is a story of community and immigration, a topic that as I was writing it, I hoped would still be relevant by the time I finished it. And that part is really bittersweet because I had no idea, I don't think any of us did, just how relevant a conversation about immigration and community and refugees was going to be. One goal tells a seemingly impossible, inexplicably local story of soccer and politics, of community and country. One reviewer said that it was Friday Night Lights for the 21st century, and I think that the most important part of that, with all apologies to football, is 21st century, to think about what America looks like in the 21st century. This is Lewiston, Maine. You knew right away it was not Lewiston, Nebraska. Starting in 2001, thousands of Somali refugees landed in Lewiston, Maine, an economically depressed town with the families of French Canadians who worked in the once thriving and now gone textile mills that dot the rushing waters of the Androscoggin River. So you can see here, the high school is on the upper left-hand side, one of the largest high schools in Maine. The Bates Mill on the right, the canals in the bottom two photos. The questions about this refugee migration probably seem kind of obvious. Why Lewiston? Why Somalis? How did they get there? The story is one of what we call secondary migration, meaning that they didn't first land in Maine, they landed somewhere else. They didn't look at Maine and think, hey, that's the second whitest state in America. Let's go there. <laughs> so they landed elsewhere. Secondary migration is a really tricky thing to capture because once a refugee leaves his or her initial relocation spot, and most of Lewiston's population originally traveled from refugee camps like Dadaab or Kakuma in uh, Kenya to the outskirts of Atlanta, and these are shots um, of Kakuma refugee camp. But once they leave that initial relocation spot, the feds largely drop out of the equation. So if you look at where they came from, and in the upper right-hand corner, you can see what they're doing at the camp. They're playing soccer. They wind up in one of the coldest, whitest, most Catholic, French-speaking, economically depressed towns in the Union. Once, what happened is that a few families found their way there because of some weird relocation stuff. But once those few families settled, word of mouth motivated more to come. They came at first by the hundreds, by the busloads, and then by the thousands. It was not necessarily a smooth transition, I'm sure. That's shocking to you. Within a year or so, the city's mayor wrote an open letter asking the Somalis to tell their relatives and friends to stop. Stop coming, he wrote, that the city was at capacity. 
A few years later, a man threw a frozen pig's head into the downtown mosque during evening prayers, an incident that became the center of Elizabeth Strout's award-winning novel, The Burgess Boys. But in more ways than not, and I always say this really cautiously, Lewiston is an example of a refugee community successfully integrating and negotiating with its chosen landing space. Walking through the streets of this French-Canadian town is now a global experience, and that's a critical facet to how this place has tried to carve out a better future. The high school soccer team, in no small way, has played a truly significant role. This is my single favorite photo that I shot for the book. This is summer soccer in Lewiston. In the distance, you see a roof. That's the Androscoggin Coliseum, which is the single most important building in Lewiston. It is the hockey arena. The Somali kids play soccer in its parking lot in the winter because it is the very first parking lot to be plowed in the entire city. <laughs> and they learned that early. So this is before a summer game. And what you see is the players talking to coaches McGraw and Gish. And in the background, you can see their mothers and sisters who use the games as a place to find some leisure time to talk and catch up. This is Maine. In the fall of 2015, the Lewiston Blue Devils had a historic, nationally ranked, undefeated season, putting up the most ungodly numbers and statistics of any team I've ever looked at. Well, they, when they landed in the state championship game the year previously, 2014, the number one seed, they lost to upstart Chevers High School, the number seven seed. It was one of those games where the day after no one talked about who won the game. They talked about Lewiston losing the game. But in 2015, they were a veritable dream team. On their road to that state final, they outscored opponents 113 to 7. Soccer is not a low-scoring game in Maine. I know that's one of the big complaints of soccer. And in fact, they beat Mesolonsky two nights ago 11 to 1. Double digits. Lewiston is even more remarkable, 113 to 7, when you think that this is a really sportsmanship-minded team that tries to keep the scores down so that they don't humiliate their opponents. So these are the records that they put up, putting in their second string, their third string. Once they're up by five, all starters sit down. At the 2015 state championship game, which took place at Portland's Fitzpatrick Stadium, over 4,500 people filled the bleachers the most ever at a soccer game in state history. Take a look at that crowd for a minute. This is Maine. So one goal is very much about that season. It's about the art of soccer that these young men play and the support network that the community built around them. It is about why sport matters, about where it fits into the threads of our daily lives and, and what we can learn from it. Soccer is a microcosm of Lewiston's transition from former factory town to global host. It's not a hoop dream story where kids are using sports to escape something because these kids aren't trying to escape. That part already happened in their lives. Soccer, rather, as I write in the introduction of the book, is how these kids live where they landed. The story of the Lewiston Blue Devils is not one of overt politics in the way that Smith and Carlos was or the way that taking a knee before a football game during the national anthem is. This team, rather, says their coach, plants seeds for their community to grow. And the coach, the players say, don't care where they're from as long as they pass the ball. In one goal, listening to athletes isn't necessarily about paying attention to their explicit politics. It isn't about asking why they do or don't want to go to the White House to celebrate a victory, or why they might raise a black glove fist into the air or take a knee during the national anthem. It is about actually listening. As the varsity roster for the Lewiston Blue Devils began to change, Coach Mike McGraw, who'd been in the driver's seat for decades when he makes it to that state championship game and he was in his fourth decade of coaching, Lewiston born and bred. But he had to listen. This isn't necessarily an easy task for a head coach. And anyone who knows a coach knows that listening is not 
always their strong points. Especially a coach who is so firmly entrenched in a team's history and in a school's history and in a city's heart and a city's culture. This is Mike McGraw, who texted me about 30 minutes ago because the freshman beat Brunswick 7-1. to one. One of the things I've learned, he said to me, is to do less talking, which is really hard for me. You have to do a main accent. I can't do a main accent. McGraw had to listen to his players when they showed up late for practice because they had to accompany a parent to a doctor's appointment and serve as a translator. He had to listen to his players on hot days during Ramadan when running laps was simply impossible. He had to listen to his assistant coach, Dan Gish, about how the talents and skills of the new players necessitated a change in strategy from a direct game, what we would call kick and chase soccer, kick the ball as far as you can, everybody run and kick it again, to a possession style of soccer, which is fast moving and patient, unselfish and beautiful. And he had to listen to this guy, Abdi Jabbar Hersi, who he hired as an assistant coach in what was a really key turning point in how McGraw listened to his team. Abdi Jabbar, who's on the left, he's standing next to Malid Abdo, who's a central character in the book. He's the master of the front handspring flip throw-in, and if you don't know what that is, read the book. Um, Hersey is the son of Abdullahi Abdi, and Abdullahi Abdi is the eighth grade coach. He's the middle school coach, but he is really, as one community leader said to me, the coach of everyone. He is a constant sideline presence for the Blue Devils. He is someone who works with every player before they hit the varsity roster. And he, he really, he coaches so many different community teams that I couldn't tell you how many there are. His son, Abdijbar, played for McGraw, like most of his brothers did and still do. Bilal Hersey is the top scorer for the Blue Devils right now. And in 2014, Abdijbar Hersey became the first Somali coach hired by the Lewiston, Lewiston School District. I'm going to read a very short passage about how that came to be. Hersey says, I always wanted to get into coaching. He shrugs, smiling, before saying the obvious. My dad is a coach. Several people applied for the job, but when Hersey walked into the interview, Fuller, who's the athletic director, knew he was the right person at the right time. Hersey, too, could feel it as he answered a barrage of questions from Fuller and McGraw. I already knew, Hersey says, Fuller later told him. As soon as I saw your name, I was happy. McGraw was excited to add Hersey to the coaching staff, and not just because he finally had someone who could shout directives in Somali, something he knew would be a strategic advantage, keeping other teams in the dark. He had spent years wrapping his head around the changes taking place on his roster and in his classroom. He'd buried himself in books and attended coaching conferences and clinics, but most of all, he listened to the people around him, knowing he needed them if he was going to win a championship with these players. I needed to take who their mentors were, like Abdullahi Abdi and Abdi Jabbar, all of those leaders in the community who coached them, he says. I embraced them and listened to them, and I listened to the players because I wanted, I needed to understand. Fuller views McGraw's relationship with coach Abdullahi and the hiring of Hersey as further evidence of how much McGraw changed to accommodate his evolving roster. He became a better, more inclusive coach and developed a deeper level of trust with his faster, experienced players. He was the first coach in our department, says Fuller, to say, if I'm going to be good and I'm going to relate to these kids, I've got to go into the community. So Hersey brought a lot to the table, right? He created a solid link between community coaches like his dad and the school's coaches. And he also brought, again, this strategic advantage because directives in sidelines could be communicated in Somali or Arabic to the field. And that is a huge advantage in Maine, to be yelling your strategies out in Somali. So reaching into the community, listening to the community, whether they be mentors or players or assistant coaches, by listening to needs and wants and suggestions, it helped forge a path for this community to lay the foundations to figure things out. So on the one hand, this is heartwarming and thrilling and uplifting. But in so many ways, the story of one goal is also a sobering tale. 
Because McGraw might not care where his players are from as long as they pass the wall. But the United States does care. As of January 2018, the International Rescue Committee's evaluation of the current administration's travel bans includes shocking stats that Muslim refugees entering the United States has plunged 94%. The United States, which was once this beacon, this global leader in offering the most desperate people of the world refuge, is pretty much closed for business. But this soccer team in Maine and the community that surrounds it shows a way forward, a way in. And it's not just about tolerating difference or embracing difference even, but it's about capitalizing on it. Just as Jackie Robinson, again, showed America what integration looked like so many years before the Brown decision, this team re represents a coming together in a community that's had a lot of pushing apart. So I go back to another shot of Fitzpatrick Stadium that day in November. And this again, if you take in, this is Maine. Coming together doesn't always mean staying together. There's an ebb and a flow to change, steps forward, steps back. And, and let's think about the 4,500 people watching that game. There were more people at the state championship soccer game that year than were at the football championship two weeks later in Maine. That's a really big deal. More people at a soccer game than a football game. Imagine that happening in Nebraska. Okay. It's almost the exact same thing. But what these numbers meant, 4,500 people, was that it's not just the parents and friends of the players and the coaches and the cheerleaders. It was everyone. It was a coming together of black, white, Catholic, Muslim, Franco, African. It was a we moment, a moment in which everyone had one identity, bleeding blue, as they say in Lewiston, above everything else. It was the same kind of moment that brought the ancient Greeks together for the Olympic Games. And, and think for a minute about what is supposed to happen during Olympic Games and sports and politics. The Olympics originated in an effort to stop the ongoing wars of the Greek states. King Ivitos consulted the oracle at Delphi, which advised him to introduce sport every four years to disrupt the cycle of wars. So the Olympic truce, which is still ratified by the United Nations, lasted months. It was designed to allow safe travel for athletes and spectators to and from the games. The death penalty was suspended and wars were halted so that people could visualize peace. The Greeks had a word for it, ekachidia. It loosely translated means truce. It does not, as some simplify, mean that sport, as the Greeks saw it, was apolitical or a level playing field. The Greeks didn't see the Olympics as eliminating politics from daily life. Rather, they saw sport as a way to visualize peaceful resolutions to political problems, connecting athletic competition to diplomatic measures, and invoking echidia to disrupt feuds and rivalries, wars and hostilities. How do you know when peace has come if you've never had a chance to experience it? How will you recognize it? if you've never seen it. A championship soccer season doesn't fix everything, but it brought that community together. It was their echidia for that game and maybe even for that season. And I think that envisioning peace is a really political thing. And a spectacle as small as a high school soccer game can let us do that. It creates a moment for us to see what America looks like when it takes a moment to be what it's supposed to be, what is written in all of those documents that are stored in the National Archives. It's about finding a one in the midst of the many and finding a we in the midst of the us versus them. Having a moment of together, which is the word Lewiston coaches yell more than any other word from the sidelines, sometimes in English, sometimes in Arabic, sometimes in Somali. Finding the together. Years ago, Mike McGraw asked a few players how they would say it how they would rally around the idea of together. This is what they answered. Pamoja Indugu. It means brothers together in Swahili, which is one of the languages of the refugee camps where so many of them came from. Before every single game, the entire team, black, white, immigrant, native, Franco, African, whatever, yells one, two, three, hands in, 
Pomoja Indugu. It's a really good motto. And it's one that has become part of the ritual of being on a team in Lewiston. Because Coach McGraw asked, and then he listened. Thank you. I can repeat too. That's good. I can shout. Uh, I guess I have two questions. Uh, one, did their opponents, or uh, the opponent cities, was there any resentment towards them having a much more integrated team, or maybe even having a um, there's resentment about how good they are. Um, I mean, you know, the rest of Maine still looks like exactly what you think Maine looks like. Um, there, are, there are these pockets, Portland and Lewiston, um, that have these populations. Um, Lewiston's demogra demographics changed 800%, you know, over the course of just a few years. So what really happens with the other sides um, first of all, is a very physical form of soccer. It's an abusive form of soccer because Lewiston is fast, uh, but they're small. So you see a very rough game. So that's, I think, resentment playing, it's, playing itself out. Um, that the, the sort of the motto is, you know, if you want to beat Lewiston, you've got to hurt them. Um, but the other piece of that is the racial slurs that get thrown around in a field. Um, and so a big part of this is learning how to cope with being different in a community and on the field. And so, you know, what, what your parents tell you to do and what your coach tells you to do, coaches answer always is just put it on the board, you know, beat them. Because if you retaliate, and there's actually a chapter called do not retaliate, if you retaliate, you're gonna get the card, right? You're gonna get, the, you're gonna get booked for the foul. Um, so really learning how to deal with it is the focus more than worrying about the other team's resentment. Um, but it's there and it's there, you know, it's there in ways that are uglier than you would think. There's something about taking a high school sporting event seriously um, that I don't think we do often enough. And yet then we look at some of the things that go down at high school sporting events. And some of those have made national headlines, you know, the chance to, to immigrant heavy teams or, or what have you. But this perspective is, if you're the player on the field, how do you deal with it? Um, and that's become a big change. And that's become something um, that they also have to listen to, is what are these guys hearing and experiencing um, in terms of other teams? And how do you, and how do you cope? Yeah, so that's a really good question, um, and I appreciate that. So one of the really interesting things that the Somalis do when they get to Lewiston is they start to found their own organizations. So the Somali Bantu Youth Association is one of the earliest. It's now at Maine Immigrant and Refugee Services, um, and they create their own soccer league almost immediately. The other thing that emerges, and you have to remember, this is Lewiston, Maine. This is a hockey town. They've run out of green space for soccer at this point. Everywhere you look, there's a kid with a soccer ball. So there's youth leagues. There's Lewiston Auburn Youth League, which has always been the youth league. Then there's the Somali Bantu Youth League. And then there's Abdullahi's various leagues because there's Somali tournaments all over this country, in Ohio and Kentucky and what have you that they travel to. There is an elite pay-to-play team in New England, Seacoast United, which eventually some very good community-minded folks figure out a way for these guys to get onto. Um, so there's soccer everywhere, but the single most important game happens down by the river every night as the sun's going down, and that's the pickup game, that's street soccer. And those are teams of 40, 45 guys just to a side, all ages, and it's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, um... 
Track and field and cross country is where you will find a lot of the girls. Um, volleyball to a degree, softball, and girls are starting to play soccer. Um, folks, a, a big question I always get is do the girls play soccer? In Somalia, soccer is not a girls sport, just sort of like field hockey isn't really a men's sport in the United States, so we have those sort of cultural tendencies. But the longer they're there, the Somali Bantu Youth Association did field girls teams and there are some girls who are playing. But running, track in, in particular, which I talk about in the book, um, is where you will see the record-breaking women. Yes, sir. Uh, I have uh, an anecdote rather than a question. I hope you don't mind. I would not mind at all. The, the relationship between the Olympics and, uh, and politics. Yes. Mm-hmm. For littering. <laughs> but I had a student working on the, uh, uh, the United States uh, press reaction to the, to the 36 um, games. And his the conclusion that he came to was that the Germans were on their very best behavior yeah. uh, by government order. And they, when they were over, the New York Times said that the Olympics ought to be held every year and ought to be held in Germany. That would, that would take care of the Jewish question because mm-hmm. they were on their best behavior. At a more personal level, I was in Moscow mm-hmm. visiting a former roommate, Austrian roommate of mine, who was in the um, uh, Austrian embassy. And I commented on him, uh, to him about how few propaganda posters there were in Moscow. I expected to see a lot. He said, well, it's because of the Olympics. Mm-hmm. They've taken them Taking them down. So it's a good example of how Olympics can, it was actually kind of going back to the Greek idea that maybe we can, we can have peace for a while, or at least we can look good yeah. for a while. It was, I remember staying in Athens in 2004 during the games, Athens ran like clockwork. And if you've ever been to Athens, it felt so strange cabs took you to where you actually wanted to go and (laughs) traffic moved and everyone was you know it was the the city was on and then for those of us who stayed a couple days later as soon as that flame went out (laughs) cabs were like well maybe i'll take you where you want to go but it, it they were exactly what you're saying on best behavior and those things can can show a city how beautiful and well functioning it can be And then you have stories uh, like in the days leading up to Atlanta in 1996 in which the homeless were sort of swept out of town um, or Mexico City when the students were massacred to clean house before the world descended upon it. Um, So it's interesting, the choices that that the host makes um, in terms of, of, you know, one of the biggest spectacles that humans experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, soccer, it's interesting because there was always there were always a couple of reactions that I had um, when people would say, okay, the United States is terrible at soccer, first of all. Well, yeah, the men, 
for a long time. <laughs> but, you know, can we be a little bit more specific about the United States is terrible at soccer because the U.S. women's national team has been one of the longest running dominant sports teams the world has ever seen um, and really sort of invented the way. Um, so that's the first thing, right? Americans are terrible at soccer. Well, not, not all Americans. Um, this last World Cup will just sort of pretend it didn't happen. Um, and, and even sort of thinking about how some people still ask, well, how are the Americans doing it? It's like they're not there, right? And, and sort of having this, it was good for the United States. So, you know, you don't get to participate. Um, you have to qualify. The second part of that, I think, is that no one in America plays soccer. And that, of course, ignores what every Saturday and Sunday in, in so many communities look like. Lewiston was not one of those communities. Lewiston was a hockey town. And hockey is an expensive sport. Lewiston is a, as a working class to, to poor community. The poorest neighborhoods in Maine are in Lewiston, Maine. Um, this is really a, a town, and I spent a lot of time talking about what happens because this is a very typical New England mill town story. When the mills move, what happens to what's left behind? You know, Lowell, Massachusetts turned itself into a national park that worked. Um, there's lots of other towns that didn't have that. So, so soccer was... And I think that this is part of the reaction to soccer. Soccer is often posed against football, American football, which you know, would also be a low-scoring game if each goal didn't count for seven points. Um, but I think that, that so, so there was always that back and forth, and it was considered an immigrant game or a foreign game. Um, so that fit. When these kids came, the fact that they played soccer made sense, I think, in an American context. And so it was sort of an under-the-radar thing until... It begins to creep. And, the, you know, the attachment of Mike McGraw to that is really important. I think that, you know, talking about timing and place and person, um, he made it okay for a lot of people to cheer for this team. He told me, and I, I think this is so significant, that there's a group of old men who sit high on the hill of, of Lewiston High School looking down at the football field. And they sit up there. They say it's a better view. There's no admission up there, of course. You don't have to buy a ticket to the game. But this is where these old guys watch. And I, I think they make a donation to the Booster Club every year. And he said, one day I looked up, and they were there for one of my games. Right? The old men football watchers were there to see soccer. And one of the things that I couldn't get over, I'd be at a practice or hanging out with the guys on one of the, the side fields, the passerbys who would slow down to see what was going on. Because this was, you, knew, you knew it was different and special and something that you hadn't seen before. But it was, it was a foreigner's game in, in the heads of so many of these hockey and football-loving people. And then they got good. And you know what? If we're going to – who doesn't want to win? And so then that gets on board. Um, and then they didn't just win. They really won. And then national attention came and writers came. And, you know, all these people want to see them and film them and do what have you. Um, and then soccer becomes a marquee sport. And, you know, Mike McGraw will tell you that 20, 25 years ago, if you wanted a varsity letter, you played soccer because you could just walk on the team. And that most of his players were basketball players and hockey players who were trying to get in shape for season. So they just played soccer as a lark. These were kids. It's hard to get on the soccer team now, right? You've got to really want it. You've got to work. And, and that alone, right, that work ethic piece then comes into play. So I think all of these different factors, the most important – is that Lewiston, in Lewiston it wasn't hockey or soccer. It became hockey and soccer. And that that was a significant thing for the town to recognize about itself, um, that we're good at these things. When Abdi Sharif Hassan, who's now playing D1 soccer for University of Massachusetts Lowell, when he was named All-American his senior year and Gatorade Player of the Year, you know, sort of just like Joe Lewis back in 38, he's one of us, he belongs. We did this. Um, so I think that that's, that's what grapples with, and, and soccer became less of sort of the outlier with all of that. Um, but, yeah, if you look at television ratings, if you look at, you know, even a non-American World Cup still had tens of millions of people watching it. Um, you know, you look at the numbers for the women's final, uh, at which, you know, we'll get to see that again next year. Um, yeah, there's interest. There's real interest. And now we finally have networks who have figured out how to commercially broadcast a soccer game without commercial breaks, which was really driving networks crazy. We can't televise this. They don't stop, right? <laughs> they figured it out. Yeah. Um, so here's the most heartbreaking page of the book. 
Androscoggin County voted Republican for the first time in 30 years in 2016. Um, Maine is a striped state. You guys are familiar with that. It doesn't go blue or red. Um, and that is absolutely has to do with the change in the demographics of the city. So what, where you end, and this is what I mean about, you know, there's fractures and then there's coming togethers. And you hope that the next fracture isn't quite as intense as the last fracture, that, that the coming together is a little bit more profound than the last one. It's a work in progress. So there's a lot of support for the travel ban. And there's also a lot of separation where some of the most ardent supporters of this team are the most anti-refugee, anti-immigrant. You know, you're okay, but not them. And this story is an excellent way to get into the heads of how that exists, right? It isn't, it's not hypocrisy. You can't call it that because they, it, those two things very rationally live within a whole lot of people. And understanding that and putting it into a historical and political context, I think is vitally important. So understanding why the member of the booster club who writes checks to make sure that these kids have all the cool swag that all the other teams have, Right? Or the guy who has very quietly sponsored so that this team on the bus ride home, you know, one of, the, one of the big changes, the team used to stop in the old days at McDonald's and everyone would get food for the ride home. Then they had to stop doing that because these kids don't have money for McDonald's. Right? So then suddenly, suddenly a very quiet person wrote a check and you know, made that meal happen. And so these kinds of things, some of them are coming from people who are very much trying to build this community and find a way forward. And some of them are coming from people who love this team and don't necessarily love the bigger picture it represents. Um, but, you know, you have to sort of hope that time and familiarity works a little bit at that, that, you know, what if one of these kids was threatened in some way? What if one of their mothers couldn't get back after visiting family in Africa? What if one of those stories was here? And, and we see that over and over again. And the players experience that. You're okay, but not them because there isn't an understanding that they are them, right? That was true in, in uh, Austria, too, that my Jewish neighbor is, is a good guy. Right. Uh, the grocer down the street, he's a good guy. Yeah. But Jews in general. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Some of the people, and, and increasingly, like I said, they're, they're figuring it out. And, and it's a story not of assimilation or Americanization. It's a story of negotiation. But, you know, the other piece of that, I think it, it can work even more detrimentally. Because in addition to, I love watching him play, but I just wish he'd shut up, right? You know, don't have a voice, don't have an opinion, that you're fine, but do what you're supposed to be doing. And this isn't what you're supposed to be doing. The other piece of it is that sports can give us a really false sense of comfort that everything's all right in the world. You know, you're telling me that people are oppressed? Look at that, Michael Jordan. Right, because that's a normal example of the everyday. Um, you know, or thinking, what are the consequences for a LeBron James to wear a, an I can't breathe shirt versus a college athlete whose scholarship might be on the line? Right? Or even more, uh, you know, a female college athlete who's going to lay down during the national anthem and, and not get up until acknowledged. You know, these, these tie, and that's why I think looking at the, at the micro can actually be really informative here. Because, you know, what are you going to do? Fire LeBron James? 
No, no, everyone nod. No, um, you're not going to do that. It's not saying that him taking a stance, I mean, he might anger, right, folks. I mean, we just saw a reaction to Nike and the 30th anniversary of Just Do It with Colin Kaepernick. And, you know, I'm burning my shoes. And, and you know, Twitter was sort of a, a comedy festival for about 24 hours because it was like, you already bought the shoes. <laughs> Nike doesn't care what you do with them. You can burn them, but you already paid for them. And, you know, if you looked at this, their market value went up $6 billion after the launch of that ad. Love them or hate them. You know, who's the winner at the end of that? Cap got paid, Nike got paid, and these guys don't have sneakers anymore. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, the, none of it is a, is a linear equation of making sense. But I think that, that the biggest danger there is assuming that the level playing field exists. So why is all of this fuss and furor going on? Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You mean it was rugby? It was rugby. Yeah, it was rugby. You know, I mean, that's where you have to, you know, did a, did a 90 minute state championship soccer game make a difference? Um, you know, part of part of the, you know, bringing up the question of resentment. I think there's actually some resentment in the Somali community that, you know, suddenly all these white people are so proud of us. You know, where have you been? I think that, you know, I think that it's complicated. And I think that that's, again, the most important way to unpack it. And it seems sort of maybe like a cop-out answer. Does it solve every problem? No. Does it perhaps create a spectacle that foundations can be built on? Possibly. In older and younger generations of Somalis or of people who were already there? Yeah, so there's an interesting thing because Lewiston is a French-speaking Maine town. It's the last place in Maine where you can attend Catholic Mass in French. An overwhelming number of households speak French. When you walk into City Hall in Lewiston, Maine, there are four placards of translation, English, Somali, Arabic, and French. It's crazy. So one of the interesting things, and this is a very familiar story to anyone who studies U.S. immigration, is that Lewiston is an immigrant town. These folks all came on the Grand Trunk Railroad from the north. So it's not the Ellis Island immigrant story, but the mill towns, you know, it was Boston entrepreneurs that built the mills. They harnessed the power of the Great Falls of the Androscoggin. It was text, I mean, it was one of the central textile manufacturing areas in the United States. It was called Spindle City. Auburn across the river was the shoe manufacturing plane. It was, it was, a, it was a mecca. Um, where did the labor come from? The labor came from French-speaking immigrants um, coming down from, from Quebec. And it's not that long ago, right? This is, this is sort of pre-Civil War on to you know, just before World War II. And it even flourished during the Civil War because Benjamin Bates, who built these mills, forecast what was going to happen in terms of the war, and he stockpiled cotton before all of that got shut down. So this was a place that attracted tens of thousands of French-Canadian immigrants. So you would think, oh, they must be super understanding of newcomers who have a new language, right? The largest chapter of the KKK outside of the South was in Maine. Why? In response to French Catholics. French was outlawed. Children who spoke French in school were punished. Um, parochial schools were founded all over Lewiston because they needed to create their own schools so that they didn't lose their language and their culture. So preservation of French culture was one of the identifying factors of Lewiston for generations. It doesn't make them hospitable to a different kind of newcomer. Um, and that's where race and ethnicity and religion, and religion's a big one, and we haven't really touched on that. But thinking about all of those factors of difference 
and territory of, you know, we were here first, we were hardworking, we came, we didn't get handouts. All of those sorts of very stereotypical reactions to an immigrant community absolutely are there. But the kids, you know, talking, getting to your question about generation, the schools are at the forefront of this. And, we, and that's also a common part of immigration history, right? That, that school and workplace are, are where contact happens, where Americanization happens, where learning how to speak English happens. But Lewiston High School is an interesting high school. 25% of Lewiston High School is now African. 25% of Lewiston High School. But 75% of Lewiston High School is on free or reduced breakfast and lunch programs. So Lewiston's biggest problem is white intergenerational poverty and opiate addiction and those things, right? Not immigration. Immigration is turning numbers around that Lewiston needs to have turned around. So you have, it isn't really as much of a generational thing as a who sees this as a way forward and who, who is entrenched in the past. Because Lewis, there's so many in Lewiston who think it's best days are in the rearview mirror. And that's something that, that needs to be turned around. I think the most perpetuated myth is that their medals were taken away from them. Um, I, people argue with me about that a lot. Yes, they were. No, they weren't. <laughs> Tommy has his medal. Um, in terms of myths, I wish I'd spent more time on Peter Norman. Um, Peter Norman is the third man in the famous photo, the white guy. Um, he's the Australian uh, who just kicked out Carlos for the silver. And he wore an OPHR badge, um, and he was really crucified in Australia when he went home for doing that. He had asked the guys beforehand, he said, you know, I'm not going to do this, but he asked for an OPHR badge as an ally, sort of before we even had, you know, we didn't talk about allies um, then, but this was a, you know, this was a sprinter from Australia who wore the badge, and I wish I had spent more time focusing on Peter. Um, Tommy and John were both pallbearers at, at Peter's funeral. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting connection. It was one of those sort of Jesse Owens and Lutz Long connections that is, you know, you pass in the night very quickly in this really critical moment. Um, but it was a relationship that, you know, historically I think was really meaningful. Um, so that's, I was going to think something that I missed that I wish I had sort of gone after more aggressively. It would be Peter's story. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Are we, are we good? Thank you so much.